Welcome to the History of Psychology show. I'm your host, Christopher Green, from York University in Toronto, Canada. The purpose of the show is to interview working historians of psychology and related disciplines, um, not only about their research and their recent publications, although I will certainly do that, but also about their own academic and personal backstories and their views of the discipline more generally. So here we go. Uh, for this very first episode of the show, I have lined up a very special guest, John Jackson of Michigan State University. I have known John for many years, and he has done fascinating, even revelatory work on the history of scientific racism in North America. And with the recent sad reemergence of authoritarian white supremacist and anti-Semitic strains in Western politics, he has begun work on the origins of what is now euphemistically called the alt-right. Uh, given the state of the world today, his work has become more important than ever before, so I am glad to be able to share him with my listeners. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's been a pretty unusual year for all of us, uh, especially academics. Are you teaching this year? I am. I am. I'm teaching on Zoom, as I have been doing, like most of us, since, since March. So what's the hardest thing you found about being online? You know, as one ages, <laughs> one finds, I find, uh, I find being in the room in the class with the students, I can kind of feed off their youthful energy and vigor. And um, I really miss that. And, and knowing that they are going through as much pandemic related worries as the rest of us makes it difficult. Um, so I really miss actually just being in the classroom with students. It's just not, the, it's just not the same. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there anything you like about being online? Well, I tell you what, so uh, I, I was meeting twice, you know, the class was scheduled to meet twice a week for an hour and a half. Um, and I made uh, I, I use this uh, online program called VoiceThread, which is a very, it, it's, I, I really like it. It's, you know, you can load up your slides and then you can draw on them and, and, and narrate them and annotate them. And so I made half the class kind of lecture based where I set up the readings. So on Monday, and that was all asynchronous. So I would get that loaded up and they could do that at their leisure. And then um, we would meet and discuss that and the readings on Wednesdays. And, you know, it, I really kind of like doing those voice threads. Um, doing it this way is, is kind of fun. And I think the feedback I got from them, they really appreciated um, being able to do it when they had time to do it. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. Do you think you'll do continue to do any online teaching after it's not necessary or has this been enough for you? I've got no idea. I really don't. Um, I kind of want to hang on to the asynchronous part of it. You know, I'm not thinking that far ahead right now. It's like, okay, I have a class, you know, this class, I have the final bit of this class, the, the papers are due tomorrow. And then I have a whole new class to plan and, yeah. and get ahead. What, um, what are the courses you're teaching right now? Uh, right. So I'm a 50% appointment. So I only teach one class right now. I'm teaching a class called evolution in society. So we kind of did Darwin, um, what was called the Negro extinction debate of, of the 19th century, eugenics, social Darwinism. Uh, we finished with sociobiology and evolutionary psychology. And uh, next semester, uh, what is the class called? Science and social policy. And um, that will be, uh, I'm teaching about pandemics. Um, trying to get up to speed on that. Um, I guess pandemics weren't nearly so interesting a topic about a year ago, but now all of a sudden. Well, you know, I had actually started to kind of read about um, smallpox. The pandemic thing became very interesting, particularly in a public affairs context, right? So, so this, if you start to think about like the eradication of smallpox, um, yes, it's scientific, wonderfully wonderful thing. But I started thinking about what kind of government tell it what kind of governance is needed to do something like that what kind of what kind of um, large scale vaccination programs were in place what were the legal kinds of uh, implications right um 
So speaking of relevant, you uh, just recently published with uh, Andrew Winston at the University of Guelph in Ontario, an article titled The Mythical Taboo on Race and Intelligence in the Review of General Psychology. And I'd like to talk to you about that uh, first. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about your background afterwards and your earlier work. So what was the general impetus for writing this paper at this time? Well, the old guard of, of race IQ researchers who really held the line um, are dying off or getting quite elderly, right? Arthur Jensen is dead. Hans Einsuck is dead. Um, Richard Lynn is still alive, but he, he's in his mid eighties, I think. Uh, but there's a young crowd, right? Um, recent PhDs, some of which, some of whom still don't have PhDs. Um, and if you pay attention to these people, uh, they've become quite active now. And there was a particular spur uh, in the journal Philosophical Psychology. Mm -hmm. Uh, a, a, a paper by Nathan Kaufness, which kind of uh, re reiterated this this claim that that race IQ there's a taboo on on race and IQ research, something which is an old claim that's that goes back decades and decades. And the philosophers of of science, philosophers of psychology, were were very upset by this paper because they thought it was poorly argued and poorly evidenced. I was invited to be on a, well, I wasn't invited, but I, uh, uh, the call went out for a, put a panel together on kind of race and IQ in, in, for philosophy of science meeting, which I said, oh, well, I could do that. And then um, the panel was turned down and I thought, well, I'm gonna write this paper anyway. And Andrew Winston, who has been studying psychologists of the far right and how the far right uses psychology for, for decades, uh, I wrote to him and say, would you like to write this paper with me? Because they're regurgitating these same old claims about, about this taboo. Mm -hmm. And he thought it was a good idea. So, so we wrote it up. Right. So you start the article with kind of a brief review of the state of research on race and intelligence. And there's a bunch of problematic issues with that research. But two struck me as um, particularly worth drawing out here. Um, the first is uh, that you write, quote, a high heritability index computed from twins, adoption and pedigree studies has no bearing on the source of any black white differences in intelligence test scores. Now, this isn't a new conclusion. It dates back at least to uh, you know, Richard Lewinton's article in the 1970s, I think in 1970. Um, but I think it remains a difficult distinction for many people to grasp and integrate with their understanding of the issue. Could you draw it out a bit for us? If group A has markedly lower IQ scores on average than group B, then why doesn't the finding that IQ scores are highly heritable through say studies of identical twins separated at birth imply that group A is going to remain lower on IQ than group B from one generation to the next? This is a very funny question for you to ask Chris given that your quantitative skills far outstrip mine um, but but they essentially the, I, I think, want them to hear you say it yeah well I'll give my explanation and then you can tell me uh, uh, where I've stumbled on it so part of this confusion lies with this word heritability so uh, well okay heritability begins in the 1930s and early 1940s with a, an agricultural geneticist named Jay Lush from my alma mater, Iowa State University. And since we at Iowa State don't often get to brag about the, the great people who taught there, I want to make sure that I get my, my alma mater in there. Um, Lush was an agricultural geneticist. He was interested in animal breeding. And so one thing you want to know about animal breeding is you want, you know, your good stock to reproduce and kind of let the, the other ones uh, uh, drift away from, from, from your, your reproduction schedules. What you are measuring is you have a group of animals for, for Lush um, and they vary in some trait, right? So let's suppose they, they fall on, your, on your, your classical bell curve. You're asking the question, what causes the difference among that trait in those animals? In the very, if you've controlled the environment to be as similar as possible for all the individuals, then 
the variation that results must be caused by some genetic factor. Okay, so you have group A and group B. You, you've measured the heritability. That's what heritability is. Right. And heritability is the cause of the variation due to, to genetics. Environmentability is due to the environment. So if you have measured two different groups of organisms for the difference in their trait, you have not measured the cause of the trait itself. So sometimes, you know, people would say IQ is 60% 60, 60 heritable. People interpret that to mean in an individual who has an IQ of 160, 60 points of that is genes, which is not at all what the measure is designed to do. That's just right. a, a category error. So if you have measured the variation of group A within group A and the variation of within group B, you have not, in fact, measured the cause of the difference between those two groups, right? That's not something you've measured. It's just not part of the equation. So, <clears throat> and in fact, if you change the environment, right? If, the, if, if environment is identical within your group, all the variation must be due to genetics is, is, is the idea. Yeah. Now, modern genetics would say that parsing or, or parsing genetics from environment in that way genetically doesn't make sense. The environment can switch on genes and switch off genes, right? It doesn't make any sense to, to, to do that. Um, a bigger concern for the race IQ researchers, of course, is that this comes out of agricultural genetics that where you can control conditions of the corn you're growing. That was Lewontin's example, of course, was corn. Right. Um, and there's a reason for that because it comes out of agricultural genetics. You can control that environment to a to great degree, which you cannot do with humans. So the idea that a race IQ researcher is measuring with any kind of precision compared to agricultural research, you know, those papers, and this is one of Lewontin's points that he makes, the, those papers in, in behavioral genetics would never get published with the standards that are set for agricultural genetics. And one of, one of the people who, who actually made this argument um, into the 1990s started, actually criticized the use of heritability studies in twins uh, before Jensen's famous 1969 paper, which introduces it to the psychological literature. Even before that was a guy named Oscar Kempthorne, associate of Jay Lush at Iowa State, who was a fierce critic of Jensen and the use of heritability to the to the argument that Jensen was making. Right. So that's good. Um, so that's the one of the two problems that I thought we should talk about. The other one is the issue of race itself. It seems to me the main problem with attributing IQ differences to race is that race doesn't seem to be a genetically coherent concept. Um, it isn't biologically real, as some people say it. Even though most biologists today accept this, I'm sure it seems like a strange and even bizarre claim to many people who probably go through their daily lives effortlessly identifying people they encounter on the basis of their race. We regularly talk about racial differences in things like cultural tastes and political preferences and treatment by the police and courts. So I guess the tough way of putting this question this year especially is how can black lives matter if there's no such thing as a black race right well there is such a thing as a black race it's just not a biological thing um how to begin this discussion so first of all let's i i, I often used to tell this little anecdote not an anecdote it's not true this little narrative to kind of make a distinction let's suppose you have a large comical dog um, let's name the dog Rutgers. I always thought that would be a name, good name for a large comical dog. And, and you've ordered a pizza and you, you put the $20 you're going to pay for the pizza on the, on the table by the door and Rutgers comes up and he sniffs that money and goes about his business, right? Because that means nothing to it. It's a piece of paper. Or a pizza person comes, uh, you give them the $20, they give you the pizza. You put that pizza down on the table by the door and go to get some napkins or something. Rutgers comes in. What's Rutgers going to do? He's going to eat that pizza because that's real, right? By a lot, he needs that to survive. I'm sure he, Rutgers thinks that. But the weird thing is you've just exchanged that piece of worthless paper for a pizza, which is delicious. Which one is more real? Well, of course, they're both real, but one is only real because we've decided it's real. 
we've decided that piece of paper in this context, in this time, in this place is worth that pizza. So race is like the $20. It's not like that pizza. So the race concept, the idea that people can be divided into discrete races uh, doesn't survive the modern synthesis in evolutionary biology. Uh, once you have decided that genetic populations merge into one another and that you're defining a genetic population simply by the needs that the geneticist has to try to discover some evolutionary history of this population. You choose some alleles, see if that works. If it doesn't, you yeah, well, we don't need those alleles, we'll use something else. Um, none of those, so, so in the immediate post-war period, you had this great kind of movement Veronica Lippard has written very ably on this, this great movement of trying to find genetic isolates, right? Genetically, human populations that were genetically isolated to, so that you could study something about evolution. Doing that is very, very difficult because people are gregarious. Everybody has been having sex with everybody for a very long period of time. The kind of races we see in the United States, white people, black people, you know, the kind of races defined by the census they don't map onto anything biological. Um, nope. And so when Jensen sits down or Richard Hernstein sat down to, to measure race, they get themselves in awful tangles trying to tell us exactly what they're studying. Jensen would claim that he's studying genetic populations. He is very right. explicit about that, which right. he's not, <laughs> right? Hernstein. Well, 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 so before you go so on to tell us what a genetic population is as genetic. So a genetic population is simply a group of organisms that have bred with each other more than they bred with people outside the population right. as determined by genotype. So Theodosius Dobchansky, the geneticist who kind of uh, develops this uh, from in the 1940s and 1950s is quite explicit that a genetic population is, is a pragmatic concept that you can use as means to an end. What's the end? The end is to find something about how evolution works. Mm -hmm. And so if by tracing this gene tells you something about how evolution works, then you can use it. And if not, then it has no more reality than the geneticist who wants to use it. Right. So it'd be right to say that right. a genetic population, they all share some particular gene, but by right. contrast, members of a, what we call a race do not share any particular gene. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, you can't, in fact, the concept, you cannot necessarily tell by, by appearance, by phenotype, right? So the genotype, phenotype. Right. So one of, the, one of the key things that happens with Dobchansky um, is that he's a fruit fly geneticist as everybody was at the time from T.H. Uh, Morgan in the teens onward, fruit flies were the experimental animal. Uh, Dobchansky was a field scientist uh, more than he was a lab scientist. And he found two phenotypically identical uh, fruit flies that were in fact different species genetically. Really? Yeah. So you can't tell by looking. Um, Jensen famously tried to kind of just mess that all up and say, well, you can just tell by looking. I was like, oh, no, you can't. Um, in the bell curve, Hernstein and Murray just said, well, we're just defining race, how people define race when they fill out forms. Well, that wouldn't pass muster for a geneticist. Right. Um, Right. So I often talk about genetics uh, as uh, uh, so this is the other example I use for my students. When you go to an amusement park and you go to the roller coaster and the roller coaster has a sign that says you must be this high to ride this roller coaster. And note what's going on here. That sign sharply distinguishes two groups, tall enough, not tall enough, and can do it with some pretty good precision. Mm -hmm. OK, does that mean out in the world? there really is a real biological difference between tall people and short people. Well, of course not, because you go to the next roller coaster and this, the height requirement is different. Right. So even the fact that a geneticist could, in fact, define a population very sharply doesn't necessarily grant to that population any particular ontological status biologically. It just is, this is a tool that we're using for this purpose. Right. So, so, uh, John Searle used to make that distinction between uh, epistemically objective but ontologically subjective. 
Mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a very useful idea. You can know with precision who's tall enough to ride the roller coaster. That doesn't mean there's a reality to that distinction right? beyond your per immediate purposes. It's an underlying genetic reality there. Yeah. They're really yeah. different in height, but they aren't, there isn't something underlying that that you could- Right, right. Flex. So let's back up a bit then and, and talk about um, what the term, where the term race comes from. Um, race, many people assume as an ancient term, even somehow a natural way of distinguishing among different peoples. You know, back as far as Plato, he makes the, he attributes these different personality characteristics to Greeks and Egyptians and Phoenicians and other groups. Um, but my understanding is that the concept of race was actually coined rather recently, just in the past few hundred years. And at least according to the English historian of psychology, Graham Richards, only really came to have the significance that it does today in the middle of the 19th century. So could you tell us a little bit more about the, the history of the term race and how it's been used? Yeah, I wrote a paper on this um, in philosophy of science that was taking issue with uh, evolutionary psychologists who, who, who make this argument that they make the argument that that people have been making racial distinctions since antiquity, that, that we have a mental mod, you know, the evolutionary psychologist's idea that we have a mental module for generalization and they get misapplied to people. And they try to go back into antiquity to find, oh, see, we've always done this. With the argument, you know, trying to make the argument that as the explanation for race, making racial distinctions must be hardwired in some, in some sense. Um, but in fact, you know, Graham Richards is exactly right. And the, and the vast majority of classicists, for example, argue and have for decades and decades that, that antiquity did not contain the race idea as we have it. So if you take race as something in your body that you've inherited, that you are unable to change and you will pass on to your children and then you probably with the added bonus that there's some value judgments associated with those races, that some races are better than other races. Um, the Greeks and Romans just didn't have that idea. Uh, for one thing, they had the notion that what determines the form of an organism is the environment. And so, yes, we make distinctions between these different groups of people who might speak different languages and might have different appearances. But if you moved to where they live, you would begin looking like them or your children would begin looking like them or you would start behaving like them or dressing like them or something. So if an Egyptian like child was brought to ancient Athens, he would be raised as an Athenian and- Right, uh, right. right. He wouldn't retain Egyptian characteristics, personality characteristics, having been raised in Athens. Exactly, exactly. And that, so what, right again, that race is something that inheres in your body as, as modern racial thinking is, is out the window. That, that's not the case for, for a lot of, of, of an ancient thought. Um, as in the West, as the church becomes more and more important and bonds of faith are much more important than what people look like, right? Ethiopian Christians are welcomed into the, into the, into the Vatican or the, the Pope's presence. Um, but that was more important that they, you know, there's a reason that Western Europe called itself Christendom because the faith was more important than, than anything else. And that only begins to change. We only get that modern idea of race, that race is a property of bodies that's inherited, that sharp distinctions can be drawn um, with European expansion, racialized slavery, uh, settler and colonialism, capitalism, that kind of thing is, is all of a sudden we have reasons to structure society based on what people look like and supposedly immutable characteristics that are unchanging and inherited. Okay. So after that review section in your paper, um, we come to what's really the main body of the article, um, and that's the assessment of this oft-heard complaint, the discussions of race and heredity um, and intelligence uh, and other personality traits as well um, have become taboo, that they are virtually forbidden by journals, by some shadowy cabal of equalitarians, um, that, uh, it is, that the topic is unfairly scorned by granting agencies, that it's negatively misrepresented by the popular media, 
um, that persisting in this area is, un is likely to uh, undermine academic careers and may even result in personal threats and even actual assaults. And they say that all this is true in spite of the fact that all the experts in the field are in agreement um, that uh, uh, these racial differences are dominated by genetic factors and are more or less impervious to efforts to change them by, say, enriching a child's early education and so forth. Um, so that's a really complex com uh, uh, claim, and so maybe we should examine it piece by piece. What about the taboo on publication? Is it true that journals will not publish this kind of work? Well, so there's several, even, even within that claim, there's several things you need to tease out here. So the claim actually isn't that, the claim isn't necessarily that journals refuse to publish the work because they're forced to admit that, yeah, we, we, we do get published. Uh, they claim that it's harder for self-proclaimed hereditarians to get their work published. And this is usually documented by stories of somebody who complains that they had trouble getting their paper published. Chris, have you ever had trouble getting a paper published? Well, absolutely never. No. Never. Never. <laughs> well, see, few of us, few of us can rise to that standard, right? I, you know, every, you know, that's one of the fav, you know, not getting able to co conferences means you don't get to go complain about, oh, I was so mistreated by this journal or this book editor, right? We all have troubles doing yeah. this. So to make the comparative claim stick, you would need some sort of comparative evidence. What are the rejection rates for hereditarian papers versus so-called egalitarian papers? Um, were the reasons for rejection, in fact, political ones, rather than this isn't very good science? Um, none of that data are available. In fact, right. I'm not sure how would one go about finding that kind of data. Yeah. And so you're left to kind of repeat the same old stories. Um, of anecdotes about individual people feeling they were mistreated by, by journal editors, right? So that's not, and then you look at somebody like Jensen who had, you know, 300 some publications and his 69 paper was, has been cited over 5,000 times. That's, that's not a very good taboo. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's um, the first one. Um, is there other things? To, distorted, yeah, so, distorted media coverage, mainstream media coverage. Right. So, so that is an interest, they, they don't actually do a survey of what the media has said about race and IQ research, or they have no evidence of how much coverage this topic actually does get. Uh, what do they have? They have the same thing they had before, hereditarians complaining that the media has not accurately reported what their research is. Guess what? That is an incredibly common claim that all scientists make. Yep. Uh, the newspaper didn't get it. Well, newspaper. And see, this is what old people, this is how old people <laughs> talk, kids. Um, they're not getting it right. They're, they're simplifying it. They're distorting it. That's not quite what I said. Yeah. It's a very common thing for scientists to see, because technical information is hard to translate into, it, into media. It is. And so hearing from hereditarian researchers that they think their, their, their views have been misrepresented by the media. Again, it's a comparative claim. Has it been misrepresented? There's no evidence that it has. Uh, right. We get the same old kind of endless cycle of, of people claim, making such claims. What about threats to academic careers? I remember when I uh, first started here in Ontario, uh, um, Philip Rushton was having protests outside of his classrooms and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so we need to make a couple things clear. It's absolutely true that Phil Rushton was had protests outside his classrooms. That that this is in the mid '90s, early '90s. Um, that in fact, there were some real threats going on there, and the same is true of Arthur Jensen in the 1970s. Uh, you know, and the Jensen you know, at Berkeley uh, during times of great racial unrest and student activism absolutely um, had some threats, legitimate threats against him. And, and there's no justification for that. And if you go to their documentation, the hereditarian case for this idea that there are physical threats against us, those are the stories you are going to hear. You are going to hear about things that happened 50 years ago, 
30 years ago. You don't hear much about any threats against hereditary researchers these days. There's just not, it's not the case, right? They repeat these things over and over again as if what happened to Arthur Jensen in 1972 is indicative of the world today. Um, in fact, Jensen himself reported that by 1990, I think it's in 1992, uh, he says in an interview that uh, that kind of stuff happened. I don't get any of that anymore. Yeah. Right? Um, who is getting threats now? Well, uh, people interested in, you know, uh, racial justice are. In, in 2017, there were 100 bona fide threats against uh, researchers of color doing racial justice research, uh, people interested in gay, lesbian, transgender rights. Uh, uh, there's one guy who left the country because he found those threats quite legitimate. Again, comparative claim. Yeah. The right, the violence threatened by white supremacists far outweighs any kind of social justice warrior threats of violence against academics. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, Rushton and Jensen, although there were protests, their institutions stood behind them and they ended up having full careers. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so and a lot of times when you hear about this, what do you hear? Uh, what do you hear about? You hear about uh, a student protest. So, uh, you know, I guess one of the more recent examples is Charles Murray's um, co-author co of The Bell Curve, who now has a new book uh, that recapitulates a lot of that stuff. Um, he had a lecture canceled at Middlebury College because of protests, right? Oh, that's a taboo. Oh, my goodness. Well, Okay, um, 50 students were disciplined for that. That's not very much evidence of a taboo. He's been invited back. He hasn't gone back because we're in a pandemic, but he was invited back. Um, so, and I, I tried to make this argument in the paper, um, but Andrew didn't like it, so we cut it out. Because Andrew is the Andrew is the more uh, steady of us. I, I kind of, I, kind of <laughs> I think, I think the argument that the fact that uh, Charles Murray uh, couldn't give this talk at Middlebury is actually evidence of the opposite thing they're using it for. It was such a rare occurrence that it did make national headlines and people are still talking about it. Why? If it's a pattern, we should be able to talk about lots of examples and there just aren't a lot of examples. Right, right. Um, I didn't, Andrew wouldn't let me put that in the paper, but I'm saying, I'm saying it now. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so that's that paper. And, and I invite uh, our listeners to go read that paper. It's uh, available at uh, Review of General Psychology, the most recent issue, I think. Um, I'd like to shift the conversation um, from the article, though, here to the history of its author. Um, and so uh, how did you get to be this way, I guess, is the, <laughs> the general question. Um, well, well, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> first, um, uh, where were you raised? I was raised in the Midwestern part of the United States, South Dakota and Iowa. Yeah, and were your parents academics or do you have siblings who are academics? No, no. Uh, my parents met uh, in music conservatory and um, uh, my father died when I was an infant. So I was raised uh, by my mother yeah. uh, who was a school teacher. And um, Actually, my mother is a fascinating, fascinating person. She, um, after raising two kids on her own in the in the nineteen sixties and seventies, which was, I, my sister, I have one sister who's who's just a year older than me, and uh, we we often talk about it as adults. Do you remember any single parent families besides us growing up? Really? No, we don't. Um, she uh, had a thirty year career as a school teacher, retired, did some traveling around the world, and then at the age of sixty eight was ordained an Episcopalian priest which she then was for a year, uh, for 10 years, and then retired, had a second retirement, and now is still living in the house I grew up in. Yeah. So I was kind of raised by a remarkable person. Yeah. So no, they weren't academics. Um, Did your sister go into academia? Nope, nope. My sister uh, raised a family and is now works uh, in a center for special needs children. And uh you know, her kids are grown, like mine, are grown and gone. Yeah. Because because we're old. So, so where'd you go for undergrad then? I went to Iowa State. Yeah. And that was kind of, you know, I wasn't on the ball 
as yeah. a 17 year old not yeah. probably not like you who had it all figured out oh um, no there's a bad thing there. <laughs> so i went off to iowa state simply because it was in iowa it was cheap uh and I'll be honest, there was kind of a girl who went ahead of me who was there who I kind of had a crush on. I see. And so that's that's a good reason to choose uh, an institution of higher learning. So that's right. why I went to undergrad. But you weren't doing history then, you were in a communication department, yeah? I was I was I was a high school and college debater, and that's really where my focus was. So I ended up with a speech communication degree because I thought I was going to become a debate coach. Um, so after it turns out that by my senior year. I still wasn't on the ball. And in April, I still didn't know what I was going to do. And I was at the national debate tournament in the bar after being eliminated. And the incoming debate coach at McAllister College walked up to me and said, John, what are you going to do next year? <laughs> and I said, well, and he said, come be my assistant at McAllister College in St. Paul. So that's that's what I did. I went up and was an assistant debate coach. At oh, McAllister so that's College. how you got to Minnesota. I was going to ask how I got what? to I moved to the big city. My, my 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 mother and my sister were like, he just upped and moved to the city. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, so I, I I'm the wild one in the family. <laughs> I just stepped on my own line, which is and then you went to eventually went to the University of Minnesota for a PhD. Actually, yeah, I yeah. So I was the debate coach for three years at Mac yeah. um, and discovered this is not what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, St. Paul, Minnesota is not close to anything when you're jitting in a van at 5 a.m. on a Friday morning so you can drive to Lawrence, Kansas or God help us, Salt Lake City or uh uh evanston illinois right um it's, uh, it's it sounds like being on a hockey sport. team it's kind of like being on a hockey team right <laughs> without all the equipment just uh well in those days we had boxes and boxes of evidence and briefcases and stuff these right. days um it's all done on computer i have no idea how they do it on computer but right. apparently they do right. so then i worked in a bookstore for four years and started taking classes at night um i decided my wife I got married during my time at Mac and my wife was already in graduate school at the University of Minnesota. And I kind of got interested in the history and philosophy of science, something that was kind of at the edge of my interests for a long time. I started reading up on it and, and uh, University of Minnesota, at least at that time, this is in the late eighties, was uh, took the idea that it's an urban campus quite seriously and had lots of extension classes. So. Right. I kind of looked at their extension calendar and there's night classes. Well, that's great. And look, there's a night class in the history of biology. And so I walked in to that class and there was a very nice kind of seemingly timid man teaching it with very soft spoken, but I was really enjoying it. And then uh, later when I was stocking later uh, in the semester, when I was stocking books in the bookshelf, I kind of picked up this book and went, Hey, this essay is by my professor. And it was John Beatty, a very noted yeah. historian and philosopher of biology. Yeah. Like, and uh, my undergraduate, I, I wanted to go back to graduate school in history of philosophy of science, both of which University of Minnesota has very distinguished oh, yeah. programs in. Yeah. Um, and my undergraduate grades did not justify me getting into any graduate school. But I took a lot of classes through extension, two with John, one with Ron Geary. Yeah. Um, who just died last year, mm -hmm. uh, noted philosopher of science and a few more. And on the basis of my grades in those classes and quite frankly, John Beatty's championship of me uh, in admission committee work, um, I was admitted in the history of program in history of science and technology at Minnesota. That, that, that's, a, that's an interesting story. I think those, those are important stories for our, our listeners, especially our undergraduate listeners to hear. Um, you know, you look at professors and you think it was a straight line. And what I learned is that for a lot, a lot of us, it was no straight line. There was lots of up and down and back and forth before you finally found your place. And Yeah, yeah. So I didn't, get, I didn't even go to graduate school until I was, I was 30. Yeah. Um, when, I, when, I, when I went back to graduate school, when I was admitted to graduate school. Um, full time. I took a lot of years off because I I just didn't I didn't know. Yeah. All right. I didn't I didn't know what I was doing, and I didn't have a lot of confidence in my ability to do that kind of work anyway. Give, given my rather checkered yeah. and colorful undergraduate <laughs> transcript. Um, Funny, I use those words too for my. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so when I first met you, maybe twenty years ago, you were at the University of Colorado, but you were back in a department of communication, as I recall. How did that happen? How did you fit back in? So that? I'm part of an academic couple. 
Um, I think I mentioned that by the time I got into graduate school, my wife had already was already in graduate school and every career move I've made has been following her. Mm -hmm. So she first got a job, she defended her dissertation and I took my comps, my comprehensive exams in the winter of 1993. We moved to Tallahassee, Florida where both our kids were born and because she started her first job at Florida State. And after five years there, uh, she got a better offer at the University of Colorado. So we moved to Colorado. Um, I did adjuncting and had an NSF postdoc and did this and that for a couple of years. And then uh, her department, the Department of Communication there, she's a communication scholar, um, advertised for an instructor's line in, uh, uh, and the main course they needed teaching was argumentation, which as a former debate coach, I can do. So I applied and they hired me, which was, which was, so I got a, my first, I went through all the, all the steps possible at Colorado as an adjunct on a kind of a, a my first year, I was the first year I was just an adjunct teaching two classes. And then they kind of cobbled together a one-year appointment for me shared among three departments. Um, then I had a postdoc that I had written for the NSF that I held there. And after that, I got a rostered instructorship. Right. So in you got the grand position. tour of all possible positions. In a right. And then eventually when they tenured Michelle, I had already published a book. So they transferred my position from an instructorship to a tenure track line. Yeah. And then associate professor. And then we left before, uh, before the promotion to full. Right. And then you, yeah, and then you next moved to William and Mary in Virginia, where you were a lecturer in interdisciplinary studies. Yeah. So, and so what was the experience of being in an area as undisciplined as interdisciplinary studies? Michelle, Michelle took a job at William and Mary as associate provost of, uh, you know, she said, I'm bringing him. And so they, <laughs> they created a position for me. Uh, there's a Charles, the Charles Center for Academic Excellence, I think is what it was called. I was there only there for a couple of years. Um, and it's basically, I showed up and they said, so you're a lecturer in interdisciplinary studies. I said, so what do you want me to teach? And they said, oh, what do you want to teach? Right. I think this is the job everybody actually wants is professor well, of knowledge instead of... Uh... Especially, you know, the, the, the real shock for me, uh, not to disparage the University of Colorado too much, but the University of Colorado students, particularly the out-of-state students, do not choose to go to the University of Colorado necessarily for academic rigor. They choose to go to the University of Colorado because you can get on a city bus and it'll drop you off at a ski slope. Ah. Um, people, William and Mary, by contrast, is a very rigorous academic, you know, the acceptance rate is quite low. And so it took me a minute to, oh, all yeah, yeah. All of you have done the reading? Oh. <laughs> um, so that, and I will say that um, this move to, to, the, to the James Madison College at MSU has, has kind of similarly, yeah. I have a similar good set of undergraduates, strictly undergraduates here, um, which is fine with me. I, I didn't particularly enjoy, well, I enjoyed teaching graduate students. I didn't enjoy worrying about them finding a job and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So you and I had go ahead. You've been, you've been at Michigan State for just a few years this now. This is my right? third. This is my third year. Third year, yeah. and you're now in a college of public affairs. I think I, I keep mentioning this because I think you mentioned it before. But I, I think the movement that you've made from communication to history and philosophy of science back to communication to interdisciplinary studies and now to public affairs is really interesting. Most people can't sort of shift around from department to department like that. So what's public affairs like compared to the places you've been before? Well, I'm in a very nice position here. I spent, so, so the, the only big lecture class in James Madison College is kind of the freshman intro to public affairs class. And it's actually team taught by 10 professors, each of whom takes a week or two Yeah. in the big lecture. And then there's kind of two, um, to, to recitation sections that, that the professors also run because there's no graduate students. And that was fascinating to me because it was A, a good way to meet other people in the college because mm -hmm. you're on this big teaching team. Um, but like, so I did that for my first two years and last year, the, this, the overall arching theme was authoritarianism. 
um, which again, tragically topical. Um, but you learn, you know, you learn a lot from your colleagues. But then my upper division classes are these two classes. There's a program here, STEPS, Science, Technology, Environmental, Public Policy. It's a minor mm -hmm. that you can take either as a Madison Public Affairs student or anybody can take it actually. But so I, I get this kind of mix, mostly Madison students with a good smattering of science students. Um, so this is actually finally the time in my life where I'm teaching exactly what I've been trained in, rather than fitting things in, learning new things. Um, the story of the team taught course, I really like. I think the best course I took as an undergraduate was not actually in psychology, but was a political science course I taught that was team taught by four people. And they all four of them would come in. Often these are these courses just get sort of rotated through. But in this case, all four of them would come in and one of them would do, you know, marks for 45 minutes. And then the other three would do rebuttals for 15 minutes each. And they would rotate oh. through all these different political theorists. And it was really the, the most interesting course I, I'd, I'd ever been in. I've tried to teach one like that, but it's hard to get universities to to pop for mm -hmm. a number of professors to teach a single course. So. Yeah, and I'm not sure how any of that end works. I came just as the previous system, which was similar but not identical, was phased out. So the first time I taught in that class was the first time it had been taught. And there's one person who's the coordinator and she did a, she did a really good job both times you know, there's one person who's the coordinator and takes input and, and spends, I think, all summer trying to design a class that has a little something for everybody in it. Yeah. Um, and remarkably, it does hang together really well. It's, it's at least the two years that I did it were, were very rewarding and very useful. And uh, it was really, so, you know, it's really interesting for me to sit down in a classroom where, sure, I know, I know something about Italian fascism and Nazi Germany, but now we have somebody who really knows about yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and it, that was, that was really, really, I, I know something about this and, and uh, yeah, so I really enjoyed that. Yeah. So let's return to your research um, for a moment. You've been working on the history of scientific racism, uh, not only in psychology, but in uh, a number of different scientific disciplines and in the political arena for some decades now. Um, how did that come to be your area of research, your area of expertise? Yeah, so, you know, when I got to graduate school, I didn't have, <laughs> I've been saying this a lot about myself, I didn't have a clear idea of exactly what it was I wanted to do. I was interested though, I was struck by, so um, one um, important philosopher who was actually more popular, I think, in, um, rhetorical argumentation than he ever was in analytic philosophy, maybe that's not true, was Stephen Toulmin. And Toulmin had this, this notion in a book, he published a book in 1958 called The Uses of Argument. Mm -hmm. And the philosophers all yawned. And in the second, second printing of that book, there's this forward by Toulmin who said, this book was selling like crazy. And I, he's a Brit. And I could not figure out who's buying this because the philosophers that I've talked to in the reviews have all been really, you know, eh, it's okay. Well, it was the rhetoricians who were buying it, right? right? Uh, because Uses of Argument was a book that kind of argued that what counts as a good argument over here in this field might not be a good argument over there in that field, right? Which for 1958 philosophy mm -hmm. was mind blowing, right? Yeah. What, an argument is valid or it's not, I don't understand. Yeah. Um, but for people, from the rhetorical tradition that always looks as argument is situated and addressed, arguments don't exist by themselves. Who's saying it is important? Who they're saying it to is important. Um, this book was was this kind of revelation and kind of reshaped the field at least since since that time. So I was kind of interested in uh, could I make a dissertation topic out of something having to do with science and the law, right? What makes a good scientific argument might not make a good legal argument. Um, at the time, there was a very distinguished American legal historian named Paul Murphy, um, in the, kind of in the twilight of his career. He had been instrumental in shaping American legal history in the, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, so I took some classes in constitutional law, the history of constitutional law from him. And um, I found out there's this, there are these psychologists who, who testified in Brown versus Board of Education but when you go read the histories of Brown, 
it's kind of like Thurgood Marshall did this and the NAACP did that and they decided they wanted some psychologists. So they got some psychologists and then this happened and it's like, well, who are these psychologists? What were they doing? How did they position themselves to, right. to become expert witnesses? So, so just for the people who don't know and the, who are listening, Brown v. Board is the decision that desegregated schools in the U.S. in 19... 1954. 54. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I asked Paul Murphy about that. And I said, so has anybody written? He said, no, nobody's really written about those people in what he would consider at least, you know, a good history. We have their own accounts and we have recollections and stuff like that. But you know, as a historian, that doesn't count. Um, <laughs> so that was my dissertation topic. So that led me into the history of psychology and um, history of the scientific study of race more generally. And uh, that was my dissertation topic was, was looking at Kenneth B. Clark and the other psychologists, sociologists, and anthropologists who served as expert witnesses in this testimony and testified in these court trials, wrote a brief for the Supreme Court, um, and how they saw themselves as socially active scientists, which is a tightrope. Mm -hmm. It's tough to walk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've, you know, you've done a lot of work in that. Can, what other, you have a couple of books out. Tell us about your books. So the dissertation ended up being my first book published in 2001. So we're coming up on the 20 year anniversary, um, social scientists for social justice, which kind of looked at, um, the good guys, I always say, right. The, uh, how they, how they actually started preparing for that court case, which was decided in 1954 for a, for really the decade beforehand, started conducting right. studies and making arguments in the professional literature. This is like Kenneth and Mamie Clark. And... Kenneth and Mamie Clark, Isidore Shine, Stuart Cook, um, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of those folks. Uh, yeah. Sociologist Alfred McClung Lee uh, was also a very important person in this in this effort. Um, anthropologist Robert Redfield from the University of Chicago. So when I was writing that, I became aware of this kind of group that was in opposition to, to those guys, um, led by Henry Garrett, who was for 35 years, 34 years, I think, um, the, the head of the psychology department at Columbia University, one of the first people to write a statistics textbook. Right. Exactly. President of the American Psychological Association at one President point. of the APA, Mamie Phipps Clark, um, her dissertation advisor. Really? Um, because she was a math major and she said she wanted to show this racist old coot that black women could do math, damn it. Mm -hmm. um, which is always, that's, that's, that's the kind of person you like, right? <laughs> so Garrett was kind of a spearhead of people, of scientists who were against the Brown decision, who absolutely believed things like uh, 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 the IQ gap between white people and black people absolutely does justify racial segregation and mounted kind of this counterattack after Brown that lasted about 10 years till the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And I was actually gonna look this up when, when this occurred. Um, ben Harris, the historian of psychology at New Hampshire, mm -hmm. um, the year Chiron, which was the, the, the Chiron is the Society for the History of the Social Sciences. It was at, it was at uh, the, the, um, the conference uh, was at the University of Richmond, which was Henry Garrett's alma mater, undergraduate alma mater. And Ben put together this panel, which consisted of me and Andrew Winston, who wrote the paper with me for a review of general psychology on Henry Garrett, and, you know, what he was about. So I gave a paper on Garrett's opposition to, to, to Brown and kind of what his arguments were and stuff like that. And then Andrew stood up and gave his paper on Henry Garrett, which was filled with Garrett's connection to the neo-Nazi underground and his publications in, in, in uh, Nazi journals and uh, his, his, his involvement with the anti-Semitic very far right. And I, I mean, I was just, my jaw hit the floor. I could not believe the rather awful political connections that Garrett ended yeah. up with. Yeah. Um, and that just, that, that was one of those ideas. I often talk about ideas as, you know, the ones you have to write that just won't let you go. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a sequel of sort you know, the, the first book were on the good guys. I wrote a sequel on the bad guys uh, called Social, uh, um, what was it called? Science for Segregation about Garrett and his cohort and the uh, 
the and indeed the the very bad connections they had to the to the, to the anti-Semitic and, and racist far right. right. And and when did that come out? That came out in 2005, also mm. from NYU Press. You know, they actually mounted uh, different cases in the early 60s, 1961, 62, 63, uh, on the basis of if we can prove that racial segregation is psychologically beneficial to, to, to white people and black people, then we have overturned the factual basis for Brown and can preserve segregation. That was essentially the argument. Yeah. Um, it didn't get very far. Um, but the and it was funny when I was researching this book, the, the response from other academics was, you know, why are you wasting your time with these marginal figures who mounted these court cases that didn't go anywhere, right? It, you know, it's kind of like, who cares about any of that? And in recent years, that critique has not been often made. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, suddenly all of that stuff about the relationship between the extreme right and the kind of the respectable right has come very sharply into focus in the United States and in Europe uh, with recent political events. Right. And so and so now you have this really fascinating new blog called Fartle's Bear, um, <laughs> which is about the origins of the alt-right. Um, yeah. uh, first of all, uh, explain that uh, interesting title to us and then tell us about the blog. It's a it's a dumb joke. The the, the blog is altrightorigins.com. Um, and I just call it Fartle's Bear. It's a it's from Shakespeare. It's from Hamlet's most famous soliloquy, right? When he's he's up there whining about how uh, you know life is tough and and um, among the list of complaints, he says, "Who would Fartle's bear?" And what it just means is, "Who would burden?" Fartle's is just an old fashioned word for burdens. Who would bear up these burdens when they could just make a quietus with their bear bodkin, right? When right. they could just kill themselves. And I don't know, that Fartle's bear just, oh, it seems like, well, there's grizzly bears and there's polar bears and there's Fartle bears. <laughs> it just tickles me. So I called it Fartle's bear. Um, <laughs> my wife kept saying, are you sure you want to, are you sure you want to? I was like, yeah, I think it's, I don't know. So that it's just a silly joke. Um, the blog I started after the election of Donald Trump because, well, uh, several things came together. One was that election, which made quite clear that the so-called marginal extreme right might have been more central to conservative politics than we were previously willing to admit to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, my feeling that I could do something about this, even in my own, for even just for my own mental health, to kind of unpack some of this history of who these people were, and and the connections between the people like respectable Henry Garrett and the ultra non-respectable bio biochemist named Robert Kuttner, who was a neo-Nazi, a close associate of Garrett's. Um, so that was one of the things that kind of sparked this. The other was, um, this happened when we were in Virginia at William and & Mary, and um, I was kind of, I had finished up one project and it's kind of, what should I do next? And during this research I did so long ago with, um, on, on the Science for Segregation book, this guy named Roger Williams, who was a biochemist at the University of Texas, kind of got on my radar. Um, he was very involved in the 50s with kind of the nascent libertarian movement and wrote this book in the 50s, which is still in print by libertarian presses on the something like the biological basis of individuality, that everybody is biologically unique and different. And he like was involved with kind of this nascent libertarian. And I thought this, this guy, Roger Williams, that could be a that could be a nice little paper, right? That could be a nice little thing. Um, he, he's still kind of touted by libertarians. And so one thing is like, so, so who is really citing Roger Williams? Who was kind of, you know, in the fifties and sixties, who is, who's the guy who, who, who are the people who in the political world who are kind of relying on this book? And that led me to this man named Murray Rothbard, who is almost unknown outside of libertarian circles, but in the sixties and seventies was the libertarian theorist. Um, he was a purist. He thought uh, that 
everything can be privatized. Police forces, they can be private. Defense forces, they can be private. Um, wrote great big thick books, incredibly prolific. And once you've started reading Rothbard, you are led down some serious rabbit holes into the extreme right. So Rothbard um, was a close associate of Ron Paul, Rand Paul, a close associate of, uh, of Patrick Buchanan, um, so uh, one of the founder of that kind of paleoconservative movement, the pre-World War II right isolationism, and had some fascinating kind of philosophical ideas that took on the rampant positivism he saw in economics. He hated Milton Friedman for Friedman's positivist economics. Um, so there's a very interesting sort of philosophical distinction there that that is, you know, someday I'll write up. Right, and um, so you... Go ahead. And so you are able to sort of draw out, I don't know, uh, stems and roots from Rothbard to, you know, the guys in Charlottetown. And Yes, exactly. So Rothbard founded the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Uh, he was considered himself and probably was von uh, Mises's kind of most able American disciple. Um, it's in Auburn. And this is pretty racist stuff. Um, Rothbard, before he died, endorsed David Duke. Right. Um, for example, yeah. it's former just, Grand Wizard of the KKK. Former Grand Wizard of the KKK. Um, it's just a really fascinating libertarian alt. So, and then journalists started writing about the libertarian alt right pipeline. Yeah. Um, people moving from libertarianism into the alt right. And Rothbard is the key yeah. kind of theoretician who did that. So, I got involved in kind of all of that. So, I did a lot of archival research on that uh, in various places across the United States. In, in those before times when we could travel. Yes. And so I have a lot of material kind of lined up, but I'm just looking for time to kind of start writing it up. I've only written one paper, which I'm supposed to be revising this week one last time. It's basically been accepted. They want it cleaned up. It's on the liber it's called the Libertarian Prehistory of Holocaust Denial. Okay. And it studies how the Holocaust denial movement, yes, comes from the anti-Semitic right, but the groundwork for that is laid in the 1950s and 60s by the libertarian movement, which unlike mainline conservatism is still holding on to World War, pre-World War II isolationism. Right. And if you want to hold on, if you want to argue that we should never have been involved in World War II, one of the things you have to argue is that, well, Hitler wasn't that bad. Oh, um, I see. So it leads to Holocaust denial. So you can- It leads to Holocaust denial. You saw what's called softcore Holocaust denial rather than hardcore. Right, but there is some of that too. So, so one the, of the there's, things, but there's also institutional connections there. I'm sorry. So one ahead. of the things that comes with working in this area, uh, and something that I have little experience of at all, is that you get significant pushback from those uh, you write about and from their followers. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Well, you know, um, one thing my wife insisted on is you get professional liability insurance. <laughs> so I have that. <laughs> Sorry, my cat just jumped off. All right. Is that to um, protect from lawsuits or? Yeah, from libels. So when I when I wrote the Science for Segregation book, um, one of the things, uh, the series editor who was a law professor named Richard Delgado and and his another law professor named Gene Stefancic, who were at the time at the University of Colorado, they are no longer. And one thing they suggested is send the manuscript out to an expert in the field and have them do a libel check, which is just... That way, if you do get sued, you can say, well, I did a libel check. That's due diligence. So my hands are clean. Um, so I sent it off to Paul Lombardo, who's a law professor at University of Virginia, who's a, um, an expert in the history of eugenics. Uh, Paul Lombardo is the guy who actually did track down Carrie Buck in the famous Supreme Court case oh, really? of Buck v. Buck v. Bell, yeah. which, which justified uh, compulsory uh, sterilization of institutionalized people. Um, and what Lombardo found, of course, was that she's not mentally retarded or in the terms of the time, feeble minded. She's she was fine. Um, so I had him read the book and he, he called me and he said, you know, they're never going to sue because discovery goes both ways and they are not going to want to turn over anything. Which um, means just to uh, uh, draw that out, which means that if they uh, subpoena materials from you, you can subpoena materials from them to do your defense. That's right. Exactly right. And, you know, the, uh, um, and they don't want that. Which, 
just for the home audience. This is <laughs> Ada. She's named after Ada Lovelace. Oh. Our, my wife likes to name cats after famous pioneering um, female computer scientists. We had Grace named after Grace Hopper for a number of years. Um, so yeah, so Phil Rushton um, did write me a, a, a vaguely threatening letter yeah. um, about, uh, you know, nothing too overt. The review of general psychology article on the taboo got some, um, somebody dropped this, oh, well, this is defamatory uh, on Twitter, you know, yeah. if, to the extent that you take that kind of thing seriously on Twitter. But I, I really, I don't worry about it a whole lot. Yes, you, you get, I get some, you know, I'm a big white straight guy. Um, uh, and my kids are grown and gone. They, they, they're, you know, my son was arrested in Portland for protesting at a Black Lives Matter. Uh, you know, they're more radical than I am. I, you know, nothing is going to happen to me. Um, so the Twitter, the, you do you engage with these guys on Twitter or do you just ignore I, I rise to the bait. It's to my shame. Um, it's the old debater in me. It really is. It's like, well, that's not a good argument. So I, I, I you know, the hereditarian psychologists aren't as bad as some of the libertarians. Mm -hmm. um, some of the libertarians really are immune to any sort of evidence. But yeah, I do. I, I, I engage with them more than I should. I think I'd be uh, in a I, constant state of anxiety, but you seem to uh, to manage it. I kind of well. like it. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like it, right? What is it? Uh, 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 any attention is good attention. I don't know. Um, it's it's. I'm not in a constant, you know, because I, I have trouble imagining what a consequence of this could be. Yeah. You know, what they're going to say something mean about me. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'd worry in this day and age that someone's going to take it too far, but you don't seem to think that's a take it too far. You mean violence? Well, yeah, what something like that, or you know, confront you personally, or you know. well, considering I live uh, half a mile from the Michigan courthouse, which was shut down uh, because of legitimate threats of violence against uh, uh, the, the the board of electors um, just earlier this week, maybe yeah. I should be taking that more seriously. But honestly, I'm. I don't think I'm that important. I just don't think I'm that important, right? Um, I don't know. Well, that's I probably don't... a good place for us to wrap it up. Thanks so much for spending Yes, time. yes, with the conclusion that you've just spent some time interviewing somebody who's not that important. I think that's a great place. <laughs> great place to stop. All right. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. All right. So that's the end of our first show. Um, I'd like to thank our special guest, John Jackson from Michigan State University. I'd like to apologize to the city of Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. I mentioned them earlier when I meant instead, of course, Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, didn't mean Charlottetown. And um, this would be the point where you'd normally hear in a podcast about sponsors and crew and all that. I got no sponsors. I got no crew. It's just me. Um, if you'd like to leave comments um, below the video, we'd love to hear what you have to say. And um, that's all for this time. I uh, hope you come back and watch the uh, History of Psychology show again. I'm your host, Christopher Green from York University in Toronto, Canada. See you next time.